Hi, this is going to be a quick video explaining some basics about Greek, which a person who claims to know how to read Greek ought to know, but unfortunately, there are a number of Christians, not merely the King James only people, who pretend to know Greek and do not know it. You need to be aware of these people, you need to avoid these people, and hopefully someday God will do enough warning to them directly because you can't help so that they will stop pretending to know scripture they don't know okay now we all have our beliefs we all have our ignorances we all make mistakes and that's okay but when you pretend to know something you don't know you're lying to God okay that's the big problem with the King James only people and why I had to make so many videos against them because they all pretend to know the Hebrew and Greek in order to say that the English, okay, is, uh, you know, divine, which it isn't. And it's been proven not divine in the King James only, King James Bible, by the King James translators themselves in their own preface to the 1611. And also in many translations since, in many manuscripts since. And that's okay that it's not perfect. But the King James only people try to claim it is perfect and then they fake, they lie against the Bible and claim knowledge of the Greek and Hebrew they don't have. But they're not alone. In particular there's a guy and his link will be in the video description who claims that the Greek verb harpazo, which is right here, this is the actual word in the Greek of 1st Thessalonian, this is the vocabulary form how it's spelled. He is so ignorant about the verb, he doesn't know the difference between an omega and an omicron. Okay? For example, in Greek, this is an omicron. Hoi. Alright? Here's another omicron. Autois. Okay, I'm using a combination of Erasmian and other pronunciation. Alright, I'm not using modern Greek. Alright? Here's another Omicron, right in our verb, harpazo. But the verb form in its vocabulary form ends with an omega. All right, now when you're writing in a comment and you want to make sure that the, the reader doesn't confuse the Omicron and the omega, you will type in English W. You will write this H with an American H. You will write this what looks like a P to us in English, but it's an R. And then this is the P in Greek, but you'll write it as a P if you're transliterating in English. The A will look like an A. This is a Z. And this is an Omega, which there's no W in Greek, so you write it as a W. Now, a person who cannot read the Greek is going to make the mistake if he's on his high horse and he needs one John 1 9 he's going to make the mistake of thinking that if he sees the spelling in English letters as a W he's gonna think that it's wrong and that's precisely the mistake that's made by um, a guy named Humanities Advocate who is trying to claim that he knows how to read the Greek but he does not as is shown here now the next thing he doesn't know is he doesn't know that the rapture is a judgment. So I'm going to spend the balance of the video on that. Greek verb harpazo means to snatch, seize, take away. It's a, it's a verb of violence. Okay, this is the UBS lexicon, this is Freiburg lexicon. Strong's lexicon is not a good lexicon to use because it doesn't give you etymology and it doesn't give you the citations of where the word is used and it also doesn't give you morphology. This is BDAC, Bauer Danker. It's one of the king lexicons that all scholars use. Okay, snatch, seize, take away suddenly and vehemently, take away in the sense of make off with somebody's property by attacking and stealing it. This is specifically used of rapine rapine when you take women okay you take property and women were considered property in the old days okay to grab or see suddenly take control snatch take away it is a violent verb okay again this is Bauer Danker one of the king lexicons that are used this is Bible Works. I'm still showing you Bible Works 5 on screen I actually have Bible Works 9 but I also have a 
an HD laptop now, which I'm going to start using in my later videos. Okay, but I'm not doing that right now. Okay, so this is Harpazo. That's how you say it. Okay, make off with property. Sneal, steal, snatch, drag away. Okay, grab suddenly. It's got a connotation of violence. Okay, it's also used of taking away seed, tear out seed which also has a connotation of tearing out to plant, you know, violently plant. God uses it both ways in the Old, in the old and New Testament. Okay, sometimes you can see somebody that no resistance is offered, like Aphrodite snatching away Aeneas. This is why you don't want to use Strong's, is that your real lexicons that scholars use give you citations in Greek literature so that you can track the usage of the verb. Okay, see this is a Persephone being snatched off to Hades, which I'll cover in another increment because that's about another person who can't read Greek and pretends that he can. Okay, so Harpazo, no resistance offered, Aphrodite snatching away Aeneas, who is in danger. In other words, you can snatch away somebody to rescue them, and that's the idea in the rapture also. Okay, and then these are different citations in Greek literature where you can find the other uses of the word. Okay, Rhodius, for example, Hesculus. Okay, so you know, a real lexicon will tell you where you can find the verb or the word used so that you can check how the word is used because everything has what's called a semantic range. Okay, the semantic range is to violently take, just shoom. It's like, you know, you go into the ground and you pull up a plant by its roots. That's one of the uses of the Greek word harpazo, and it's perfect for explaining the rapture, because this is a very famous rapture verse. Okay, this is a Liddell Scott lexicon. Liddell Scott specializes in classical Greek. Okay, this is Lunida. And this is another lexicon I really like, which is Thayer. You can get Thayer for free. BDAG is not for free, but Thayer you can get for free online from a lot of different sources. Just Google on it. Okay? Thayer specializes in etymology. Okay? So you can, you know, just sort of look at that there for a minute. Snatch or take away. It's violent. Okay? That's the first thing you need to know. Okay, now the second thing you need to know is that in the Vulgate, it's translated with rapiemorn, and, and there's no, uh, you're going to have to just take my word for it or look this up on the internet. I'm going to give you the Latin because BibleWorks doesn't show the Latin. Okay, rapiemor is talking about, is translating the Greek verb harpazo here. Okay. That's the translation, rapiemor. Now, in Latin, in Latin dictionaries, you have two forms of the Latin verb, rapio or rapto. Rapto is technically, um, well, it, let's just put it this way. It's used in a vocabulary form in a lot of Latin lexicons, okay? It is not the primary vocabulary form of the word, which is rapio. But rapto is often used in lexicons. They often use the um, that form because it's just easier for scholars. It's a convention of scholarly lookup. So our unfortunately, humanities advocate also does not know Latin. Okay, so he doesn't know that the two vocabulary forms of the same verb are used. And so in his comments, which you'll find in the video description if you're inclined to read them, he demonstrates his ignorance of both harpazo and even of the difference between omega and omicron and his ignorance of the Latin. Okay, so when you see somebody who demonstrates such vast ignorance of the Bible's own languages, it means he doesn't care to do his homework. If he doesn't care to do his homework, then what he has to say, even if right, is based on no homework, but rather on hearsay or something else. And if you and you can't, you know, it, it's going to be kind of a waste of your time to listen to that person. 
Okay, this is why I make so many boring Bible videos showing Bible works. I want you to see when I say something where I'm getting it from so you can evaluate before God for yourself whether or not you ought to even listen to me. So when I hear somebody who doesn't even know the difference between an Omicron, which is highlighted in blue there, okay, versus an Omega, which has to be transliterated in, in English word, letters with a W in order to show it here, when somebody doesn't even know that difference, they do not know scripture, okay? And they clearly, in this guy's case, unfortunately, he doesn't know the violence meaning and the judgment meaning of the rapture, even though it's standard theology. And pretty much anybody could Google and find that out. Whether you believe in the pre-trib rapture or not is your own affair. But honey, there's a lot that's written about it where you could find out what the doctrine is. All right? So harpazo is a violent verb. The highlighted uh, letter in blue in the lower left hand corner is the Greek Omega and it looks like a W in English so if you want to write Omega in an English comment using English letters you need to use a W so you won't confuse the reader if you're by contrast using the Omega then look in the upper right hand corner where the blue is highlighted and that's an Omicron Omicron is a short O it's a uh, more like an uh sound Whereas in the lower left-hand corner, an omega is a longer sound. Oh, you you know you you purse your lips more, okay. And again, finally, rapiemur is the translation. It's based on rapio, aka rapto, in a, a Latin lexicon, which Bible Works doesn't have here. So you're going to have to look all that up. You can Google it yourself and find it yourself which unfortunately humanity's advocate did not bother to do so his opinions about scripture are therefore circumspect because he has shown that he is not willing to do his homework before he goes you know off half cocked making comments about scripture that are obviously untrue okay so now we're going to go to the next verse because i need to explain or show um how we know that the rapture is violent okay and I'll do that in the next increment I think okay here is our next increment I want to show kind of briefly the idea that when the rapture happens it's a judgment for us Christians this should be standard theology you should be able to find it pretty easily by googling on judgment seat of Christ that's the theological term for it it is synonymous with the rapture. First of all, we rise in the air. And that's 1 Thessalonians 4.17 on the procedure. And then we are judged for what we did with Bible. And we're going to look at some passages that show that. Just briefly, okay, because, you know, this, this is a really pretty easily understood standard doctrine, which apparently humanity's advocate does not know, and so I want to briefly show it here, and then you all do your homework where you want to. Okay, Acts 18.12, you'll see highlighted in red and yellow, Greek word is bema, okay? It means judgment seat, and it's translated as judgment seat right here, okay? Um, that's the New American Standard Version. Okay, but pretty much all of them will translate it the same way. Okay, what it literally is, and my pastor spent a lot of time explaining this, and I'm sure he's not the only one. What it literally is, is a raised dais, D-A-I-S, on which a military commander or, you know, even an emperor stands after a battle. Okay, and the battle is the battle of this life in this case. He stands after a battle, and all the troops are assembled before him, and his job at that point is to hand out, literally, evaluation, but it comes to mean judgment, because if you were one of the soldiers who first breached the wall, you would get like a million dollars and be exempt from taxes for life, or whatever the awards were. They were really big awards when you did brave things. If, by contrast, you were a coward, you would be executed in front of everybody. Okay, 
And the quintessential passage on this, which we'll get to, is 1 Corinthians 3. But I just want you to see the use of the word bema, which is four times in the Bible, but very common in Greek lit because it's a military term. And it's properly translated judgment seat. This is a raised dais, usually with a chair of some kind, on which a military commander or an emperor or a king would stand and hand out awards or punishments after a battle is over. Specifically after a battle is over. Okay? Now, how does that apply to us? Well, it applies to us right here, except that the genitive is used here. I think it's the genitive. Let's make sure. Oh, Bible Works is having a problem because of the... Uh, I'll have to stop and start over. It's a problem with um, using XP and uh, my screen recorder. I'll come right back. Okay, it's the dative, not the genitive. Okay. As you can see here, it's in the dative. Greek word again is bema. Judicial bench, place of judgment, court. Okay, now just so that you know, again... This is Bauer Danker. Okay, this is the origin of the word to take a step forward. Okay, dais or platform required for steps to ascend a tribunal. Okay, you got magistration use, but the special use of it in the military. This is God's judgment seat. You can hear the verses on it. Okay, speaker's platform. But specifically, and most, most famously, this was used in military sense after a battle. Okay, and when my pastor covered the word, he spent a lot of time on that because he was a military guy. All right, so now look. Who are you to judge your brother? Why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Okay? The judgment seat of God is the rapture, which Paul had already covered in Corinthians. That's why he doesn't have to say that's what it is. Okay, so now we're going to go to Corinthians. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'll remove this thing so you can see it better. Okay, and let me, whoops, sorry, I was looking at the Greek. We'll just use the NASB here. It doesn't really matter. Okay, and now we'll change it over. Okay. Now, no man can lay a foundation. If anybody builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, that means God did the work. Wood, hay, straw means you did the work. Each man's work, whether it's God doing it in you or you doing it yourself, will become evident for the day. The day. Okay, the day is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord for us is the rapture. It will be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality. Okay, the idea being that if, you know, gold, silver, precious stones will melt down, but they won't be destroyed. Wood, hay, and straw would be burnt up. So anything you do of yourself will get burnt up. Anything God does in you, even when tested with fire, will at most melt down. If even that. Depends upon the burning temperature. Okay? If any man's work is burnt up, his work, not him, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Now, you know, Catholics use this to claim purgatory and all that other nonsense. They also are basing it on Maccabees, but the fact of the matter is that it's the work that gets burnt, not you. In other words, if you produce that of yourself, this is why I'm so scared about doing these Bible videos, then it's going to get all burnt up. This is why I dread the rapture, okay? Gold, silver, precious stones is what work God did in me. And I know the difference. Okay? And I'm, I'm really grateful that there's going to be some of this. But honey, I didn't do that. He did it. And oftentimes I don't know if it's him or me until after the fact. 
which is kind of a relief when I find out it's him. But honey, I got a lot of this that's going to burn. And I'm going to be embarrassed just like everybody else. Now, how do we know we got embarrassment at the judgment seat of Christ? Okay, that's what this is all about. All right. And you can, you know, pretty much this is also standard theology. There's going to be a judgment seat of Christ. Okay, and the people who know about the pre-trib rapture doctrine will tell you that that's when it takes place, which Paul is also talking about. In Philippians 3, this is where he talks about how all his works are nothing. This word translated loss isn't loss. It's actually, sh it's, it's, um, well, actually, rubbish. It's not rubbish, it's shit. It's the Greek word for shit, the way we use it in English. Okay, the translators want to cover that up. The actual Greek word is skubala, and it literally means turds, plural. Okay, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. In order that I may attain to what? The exonastasis. This, Greek, this word here is exonastasis. That is the technical word for the rapture, the out-resurrection, the exit-resurrection, as my pastor likes to translate it. Okay? And then he says, he goes on, he's talking about, you know, all this here. That's the positive side. Keep living, okay? Because for many walk that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is what? Destruction. Now, what destruction is that? We just saw it in 1 Corinthians 3. All your works are going to get burnt up. Whose God is their appetite? This is literally splagnon, and it's a, a metaphor for emotion. It literally means guts. Appetite is okay as a translation, considering what it means in English. Whose glory is their shame? In other words, they're glorying now and their falsehood. But they will be ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, who set their minds on earthly things. In other words, politicking and worrying about the Mayan nonsense. And, oh, disaster is coming. You know, uh, hello, the whole purpose of God telling you disaster is coming is so that you'll start studying scripture. Not get all hung up on earthly things of this world. Why? Because our citizenship is in heaven. Okay? So, the destruction here is at the judgment seat of Christ. And almost all of the scholars that I've, I've known of, especially the dispensational ones, will spend time saying, yeah, that's what this verse is talking about. It's the 1 Corinthians 3 judgment seat, which we just saw, okay, here in Romans also, 14.10. Okay, see, judgment seat, that's Bema again. See, every knee will bow and every tongue will praise God. Okay, in other words, this is a twofold thing. This is going to happen twice. First time at the rapture. Now, what's the rapture verse? The rapture verse is Revelation 4 1. I've covered this many times already, so I'm, I'm trying not to spend a whole lot of time in. Where it says, after these things, that's Greek metatauta. Okay, I'll show you. Well, yeah, I've got to show you that because you don't know the Greek. Okay, see metatauta right here. It's translated after these things, and that's a decent enough translation, except that uh, John uses this as a sort of divider to divide off time throughout the book of Revelation. Okay? Now, he's got it in two places here. He's got it at the beginning of the verse and the ending of the verse. This is the opening of the rapture door, and this is the closing of the rapture door which is the opening of the tribulation. The tribulation opens when the rapture occurs. This is the actual rapture verse. And again, you should be able to Google on this. This is pretty standard theology and dispensational theology to know that this is the verse that's used. Okay, What you don't find often taught in pulpits because people are so bored by the Greek is John's actual, how do you want to call it, his rhetoric, his rhetorical style of explaining it. Metatauta is something that he uses throughout Revelation to segment off the different dispensations because Revelation is a four-act play beginning with church age and then here it shifts into the tribulation. This is the opening of the rapture door. This is the closing of the rapture door and the opening of the tribulational door. 
using meta tauta. He uses it several times more in the book of Revelation to show you the difference between church age, trib, millennium, and eternity. That's the four act play, which you know, with a quadrilogy, that's Greek drama, that's the style that he uses in writing it. Like Paul, uh, John was real big on Greek drama. Paul, Peter, and um, John were all big on Greek drama, and they used Greek drama language. Peter, in particular, really liked Greek drama. He always uses epikorigeo, which is the uh, funding for a Greek play. Okay, we usually, it's usually translated organized, you know, so you don't know the origin of it in Greek. So metatauta is the opening of the rapture door, and it closes here, and so he's bracketed off the rapture event from what comes next in his book. This is a rhetorical device. After these things. See, after these things, after these things. What must take place after these things? After the rapture. Therefore, post-trib rapture has no basis. Okay, I spent five playlists explaining what, the, you know, God's doctrine about time. So you can understand that the rapture is part of an older doctrine of how God orchestrates time, which is demonstrated beginning in Genesis 5, that doctrine of how God orchestrates time. And so um, John is just simply accessing what to the reader is already a well-known doctrine. And um, he documents it in the meter in Revelation 1, 1 through 3, saying that he's writing it in 90, 91 AD, <clears throat> which I already went through in my playlists on um, GGS videos. So, Metatauta opens and closes the rapture door. Now, if we go back to the English, let me see if I can do this. Okay, you see this, the throne. The one sitting on the throne. This is this is Christ as you know God. Okay, sea of glass is us. Okay, and that again should be pretty standard theology. You should be able to Google on sea of glass and find that because that's pretty commonly known. Okay, that's us standing before the throne. Okay, before the throne. What is the throne? Romans fourteen ten again. The judgment seat of Christ. Judgment seat of God because Christ is God. Okay. Whoops. Okay, here we are. Back to it. Sea of glass. That's us. Okay, because we're reflecting him. You know, when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 to produce a reflection, I'm not sure if it's in 1 Corinthians 13, but he makes a reference to the sea of glass there and then... He also makes other references to it in his letters. Okay, full of eyes in front and behind is talking about wisdom, and these are the four seraphs. They call them four living creatures, but they're seraphs. And my pastor spent, I want to say, a year, eight months, explaining the meaning of the four living creatures as the heraldic escutcheon of Christ. And I got bored with the, with the rapture doctrine and revelation at that point. And one of the reasons I spend so much time on it now is that God spanked me for being bored with it. So don't you be bored with it. Do your homework. I understand that, you know, you might not believe in it or something, but do your homework. Because I believed in it. I understood it. I went through four years of exegesis in Revelation, which my pastor did every single day for four years. Okay, well, twice on Sunday. He skipped Saturday because we had Saturday off. That's the Sabbath. Okay. But... You know, he spent um, eight months, I want to say eight months, I'd have to go look it up in my notes, covering what the four living creatures was. And I got bored at that point. Don't you make my mistake. Because I've now spent since the year 2000 documenting the rapture and Satan's strategy and all this stuff from the Greek so that other people can see where it comes from. And whether you agree with it or not is before, you know, between you and God. But don't not do your homework okay it's judgment and that's what this is for is he standing there to judge they're, they're telling him you know you're worthy of you or to, to receive the title deed of earth and that's what the scroll is with the seven seals it's literally a scroll not a book with seven seals and each seal is a title deed to earth and each seal is saying something about Christ's right to judge 
and we are being judged during those same seven years that the earth is being judged. And if you have, if God has done his work in you, you will get even crowning as a king. If you did the work yourself, then you're going to be burned. That's 1 Corinthians 3, which we've already seen. Now, I know this was a brief coverage, but you should have enough information that you can Google. There are a whole lot of pastors that know this doctrine. And some of them teach it better or worse than others, but you can find it. And unfortunately, Humanity's Advocate is completely clueless about the doctrine of the rapture, even though he believes in it. Don't be like him. Do your homework. Peace out.